And we're live. Just like that, with a click of a button, we're back on air. It's been two weeks. Uh, I'm back here with Dr. Mike Stair. Uh, I don't know if, if you've ever heard the joke, but for some reason, Jay always wants to call you Dr. Strange, like from uh, uh, Marvel <laughs> Comics. So every time he'll like email, he'll like, I'll be talking to him and your name comes up and he's like, oh yeah, Mike Strange. And I was like, who are you talking about? <laughs> he just like has it in his mind. I'm like, I hope one of these days you show up like a full Doctor Strange costume. Uh, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be pretty awesome. I, so, I, next time I meet with him, I'll, I'll definitely have to surprise him with that. Well, welcome back to the show. Um, you're a regular here. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Dr. Mike Stare, he is a fellowship trained uh, physical therapist, uh, a consultant, and he owns Orthopedics Plus. Is that right? That's correct, yep. And Spectrum uh, Fitness Consulting. That's right. So you are East Coast based. Um, prior to COVID, you used to travel all over the world and talk to people like we are now. Um, so I guess you being homebound has the advantage of I get to pick your brain every couple of weeks. Yeah, it actually is kind of a fun uh, outlet. It's it's uh, I do love being in person with people, but it's uh, exposed me to some different opportunities. So it is kind of a, a good silver lining. Sweet. Well, I think today we've got a bunch of questions on shoulders. Um, so I think we'll kind of dive into the questions. We've got a list of them. Uh, if anybody has any specific questions that they want to ask about shoulders or anything else, uh, we just ask away and, and we'll ask them and respond to them live on the air. Uh, so the first one is uh, shoulder impingement. Does it really exist? And then the follow up is why you should care. Yeah, you know, um, one of the most common things we hear from, uh, you know, young or middle-aged active people um, is that they have, uh, if they ever get any diagnosis or they read something online, a very common diagnosis is, is impingement. Mm -hmm. um, and the sequelae of impingement, and just for those who aren't familiar with the term, uh, if you have difficulty raising your arm up over your head, uh, that term is somewhat intuitive too, because it conjures up the idea that something's pinching or impinging in your shoulder. And it makes sense if you've ever had shoulder problems re reaching overhead. Um, so you get a diagnosis clinically um, that you have impingement. Sometimes you may also uh, get MRIs or x-rays and they'll look at something like your uh, the end of your clavicle or your acromion. That's the bone on the top of your shoulder here. Um, some will say that, well, there's uh, a hook at the end of it, or um, the space there is limited because of the bone is calcified over time, um, and or not calcified, but have an over calcification, and that's reducing the space in there. So that's where the idea of impingement comes from. So here's what's really cool about investigating that. Um, the idea is that if there's something impinging, so there's a rotator cuff tendon that goes between this bone here and your humerus, the ball of your shoulder socket. And if something's impinging it, then you could see over time that that would wear it down and cause some corrosion. Um, you've, you've heard of that before, Brad. You've heard of people explain shoulder problems like that? Yep. So the logic would be then, well, what would happen if we went in there and we shaved down that bone and that would create more space? In some extreme cases, they actually just get rid of that entire joint where the clavicle and the acromion meet up. But the more common one is called a subacromial, so underneath the acromion, decompression. Um, fittingly, it's abbreviated as a SAD procedure. So um, <laughs> what they- That seems fitting. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially when you find out what the uh, results have been and what the uh, research has been. You know, it's one thing when you see some evidence that says, you know, we see what the outcomes are of the surgery and you know they're not great um you see several studies come out then you see better design studies where they randomize and they blind the participants um and then they get so many of them that they do a review well what's been happening over the last couple of decades it's a really common surgery so again they go in they shave off part of that bone and the idea is that you get more space so that would mean that you're putting less pressure on that tendon and therefore you're going to make the shoulder less painful and have better function. So they've gone and done these studies and they found the outcomes aren't great. Well, there was a really interesting series of studies. Uh, one, I think I've talked to you about in the past 
where they actually did a uh, sham surgery. So they had three groups go in. One group, they did the subacromial decompression. The other group, they poked two holes in the shoulder, never did surgery. Third group, they had them do exercise and such. Um, there was no difference in outcomes. So that's essentially the ultimate um, uh, placebo controlled trial where you don't tell anybody who's actually had the surgery or not and see if they fared any better or worse. Now, reviews have come out, meta-analysis come out and they all concluded the same thing. But recently there was a neat study that just came out and I think it was like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And they looked at these studies and they said, okay, so in one to five years, the evidence is very clear. There's not going to be a great outcome. The studies are just not good. But what happens five years and beyond? And also one other criticism of these reviews and meta-analysis is that there might have been a risk of bias in these studies. So before the study was conducted, it was evaluated in terms of its bias risk by uh, something called a Cochrane database, which uh, have you heard of the Cochrane database? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, they essentially look at all the you know systematic reviews and publish those as systematic reviews and meta-analysis. But they defined it as a very low risk of bias study. And what they did is they did subacromial decompressions, they did a sham surgery, and then they added therapy to both groups and then a therapy only group. They found that one year, five years and beyond, still no difference. So it's pretty much the nail in the coffin on the, um, the ut utility of this, of this research. Now, here's the, the two conclusions that I'm taking from this and the research is echo that. Number one, if you're being uh, advised to do a subacranial decompression, um, it's likely that this is just a holdover of a long-standing tradition of doing this mm -hmm. common uh, surgery, but the evidence is is really poor. So definitely make sure that you seek out alternative options. The second thing is they're questioning whether impingement actually is occurring or not. And that's super meaningful because you know we have wrongly thought that there's something getting pinched there in the shoulder. And this is causing that to be questioned because when you're doing therapy, um, you're not changing the anatomy there. Mm -hmm. So maybe this whole impingement idea is not validated. Um, if it were validated, we would see a big difference in outcomes if you increase that space. So um, I think that's a pretty important finding. Um, so I think it's important that if you were thinking that your pain is due to things getting impinged there, Number one, cutting out the bone is not going to help a lot. And number two, you get decent outcomes from doing surgery or uh, doing therapy uh, only. And number three, maybe there's something else going on and it's not really impingement. So a couple questions on that. Um, maybe the easiest one first is, so when we kind of look at the all the different interventions, therapy alone, therapy plus surgery or surgery, um, or the the sham surgeries versus not. What is the like the outcome, right? So it's like, are the outcomes good or are the outcomes bad? So it's like maybe they're all the same, but five years they all are terrible, or maybe they're all great. Like, what is the what's the outcome? You know, five years after you know whatever intervention is selected. Yeah, I, boy, I that's a really good distinction. I should have clarified that. Um, when I was saying that it's not effective, I probably should have been more clear. Um, they're finding that the outcome isn't any different. Yeah. That's probably the more accurate way to interpret it. Meaning that if you had the sham uh, surgery plus therapy, the therapy alone, or the surgery itself, um, the outcomes were the same. That's probably the best uh, uh, description of it. So what they're finding, though, is that people tend to do significantly better when they rate um, the shoulder function, uh, they usually find that, you know, if disability is at 100, uh, they find that the average result is that people are under 20% disability. Okay. Um, so, you know, on those disability scores, if you've been lifting and playing sports for most of your life and you're north of 30, you're probably gonna score anywhere from between 10 and 20 anyways. 
Um, so a under uh, 20% is actually a really good score. So people are getting better from treating this. Okay. And you're gonna get better if you do surgery oftentimes. And you're gonna get better if you do therapy. The, the point is, is that there doesn't seem much of a difference. Um, and, and those outcomes are pretty solid then. Like, you know, almost full return to function is pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then kind of the, the last question is if it's not an impingement, what's the, the true diagnosis, so to speak of some of these impinged shoulders? It's going the same way as a lot of, it, uh, orthopedic, uh, diagnosis. Um, which is going away from um, having a specific anatomical diagnosis. Uh, tendinopathy instead of tendinitis is, an, is one example of that. Um, low, low back dysfunction as opposed to facet syndrome is another. In this case, they're switching the term to subacromial pain, which, you know, it's not very reassuring if you're of the mindset that I need to know what the structure is and what's exactly yeah. going on. And now that might be frustrating if you're a patient, but from a, a clinical view, we're starting to become a little bit more humble about what we can diagnose. Um, because the prevalence of seeing these uh, bursal thickening, um, osteophytes on the joint, uh, tendon you know, tears, um, labral tears, humeral head, you know, de de uh, defects, it's remarkably common. So rather than making the diagnosis on what specific part of the anatomy is damaged, they're finding that anatomy is damaged in almost everybody. So it doesn't correlate necessarily with pain or problems. Um, I think what's more important is, is what works. You know, what do we do? You know, what, what deficits do they have? They have weakness of external rotation. Um, they have capsular limitation of motion. Um, they have radicular signs from the neck. I think those are more valid diagnoses than, than trying to say, oh, it's specifically a labral you know, posterior tear and that's what's causing your pain. Okay. Um, we do have a question from a listener before we can move on to the next topic. Um, Sharon said, I have impingement I have both impingement in shoulder and arthritis in my facets above my lumbar fusion, and I'm 39. Okay. So, um, you know, Sharon, about your shoulder, um, rather than conceptualizing as impingement, because that doesn't necessarily tell us what to do, what would be more effective is to look at what uh, deficits, or more specifically, um, what functions um, do you have problems with, and produces your pain. So if you know specifically what that is, then seeing a constellation of impairments. So for example, if you have pain with overhead lifting um, and movements overhead, um, I would first look at your thoracic mobility. I would look at uh, your strength uh, of your rotator cuff, your mobility of the associated structures. And if it's not optimal, I would work on treating that. Uh, the outcomes for doing that are relatively good compared to uh, just going along, you know, rest and, you know, avoiding activity. Um, when it comes to arthritis in your facets, uh, Sharon, if you're 39 and you don't have arthritis in your facets, that would be an anomaly. Um, I can count on one hand of people north of 35 that have had imaging at their spine who did not have um, some degenerative joint uh, or uh, facet arthropathy. It's incredibly common. The good news is, Sharon, is that that doesn't always mean there's going to be a problem. The fact that you have a fusion, though, um, one common problem with having a lumbar fusion is that the segments above and below where the fusion is tend to become more damaged uh, relative to age uh, than, um, than if you had not had the fusion. Um, so in that case, uh, you may be uh, a little bit more I wouldn't say restrictive, but mindful about what type of stress you're willing to put on your spine. For example, if you're an avid golfer, um, you're going to need to be hyper conscientious about um, your swing mechanics and what type of exercise that you want to expose your risk, uh, uh, what your risk tolerance is to your spine. So without knowing more about that, Sharon, it's hard to be too specific, but um, 
I wouldn't in general be too concerned about knowing that you have arthritis there. Um, I would, however, uh, just be more mindful about what risk you try to, uh, uh, to tolerate, uh, especially when it goes to rotational things. Um, not a huge fan of uh, rotational exercises where you're, you'll say, doing Russian twists, for example, uh, on people that had fusions. Um, I would be highly skeptical of doing um, a whole lot of uh, um, uh, rotational um, high force activities. Um, but that's a generalization. There's many people that are able to work around that. Sweet. Uh, another question we have. Um, this is from Facebook user. This is a very common name. We have a lot of these people. Yeah, I've heard that name before. <laughs> uh, so turn 27, when I do my arm circles, when I do arm circles, my shoulder rotator cuffs crack and pop a lot. Uh, no pain, but is this something to be worried about or anything to improve it? So I think 47 uh, Facebook user, but uh, I'm sure you would appreciate being 27 as I would as well. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the same yes. head, Mr. User. Um, so I wrote an entire article. If you want to go to Spectrum about this topic, um, what cracking is and what that means. I had a uh, professor in uh, graduate school that had a funny saying, if you hear a lot of cracking, turn up the radio. And the idea was to you know, make light of a, the notion that cracking is usually very benign and does not correlate with pain or dysfunction. And in your case, that uh, seems like the issue. So I would not worry about it. Um, if it concerns you, don't let it concern you. Um, only let it concern you if it's limiting you for doing a certain activity or if it causes you pain. Um, one funny story about this, my wife, uh, her knees crack all the time. She has not had any knee pain at any point in her life. And she's in her mid forties. Um, when we had babies, um, you know, it was hard putting them down at night or so. Uh, she had to go up the stairs backwards because she went up normally, her knees would crack and it would sometimes wake up the baby. Um, so that happens a lot and people don't worry about it. Um, nothing that you can really do is going to make it, uh, worse, um, or necessarily better. Um, sometimes that cracking is this cavitation of the fluid or pressure changes in your shoulder. Um, so, um, I wouldn't worry about it. I, uh, I just posted a link. I think it's the, why your joints crack and is it bad? Yeah. It's, you have some very good memes in here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> which is a hundred percent macros Inc. approved. You should see our internal emails that we have. Yeah. It's, there's just memes in every single email. It's pretty awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, let's see. I think those are all the questions we have currently. We can jump into the next topic. Um, under the bar tips for how to work out with shoulder pain, i.e. how to still bench and lift heavy stuff when your shoulders hurt. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have uh, one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with the shoulders. I tore my rotator cuff at 21 years old um, traumatically, you know, so using my arm for about eight months was next to impossible. Um, I was able to rehab it and um, getting back to heavy lifting was a huge goal of mine. And uh, the good news is you know, I'm 45 now and, um, you know, haven't seen really any drop off in my ability to tolerate heavy lifting. Um, a few things I've learned and uh, passed on to other people who are interested in lifting heavy for whatever reason. Um, bench press seems to be the one that most people love doing and also the thing that they had the biggest problem with. So these are some things I have found that have helped out a lot with shoulder problems. Um, one is using a false grip on the bench press. So for those who aren't familiar with that when you're using a bar, you have your thumbs over the bar instead of wrapped under. Um, I have two theories as to why that helps. One, when I have my thumbs over the bar like this, I feel like I can slightly, I don't know if you can see it, I can slightly rotate my arms. Mm -hmm. And notice what I can, when I slightly rotate my hand like that, my elbows drop, it helps me keep uh, less of a outward angle of my shoulder, more of an inward. Uh, that generally tends to be healthier, or less painful for a lot of shoulders. Um, my second theory on that, the C5 myotome, or what a lot of your arm hand flexors are, it's the same myotome that controls um, your, many of your shoulder muscles. We know that when you squeeze the bar a lot, it tends to generate a lot of tension from the shoulder. Uh, sometimes, however, a lot of squeezing on the bench can sometimes cause a lot of upper trap and raising. Mm -hmm. and I find that to inhibit 
using the scapular depressors, which keeps again the groove of your um, shoulders in a, in a more uh, congruent uh, position for the shoulder. So those are my theories, but uh, for a majority of people that works quite well. Um, in other cases, I found temporarily limiting or maybe even permanently in some cases, but most is temporarily limiting the range of motion. And a really simple way to do that uh, are with uh, floor presses. Uh, Brad, you ever do floor presses at all? Uh, yeah, I used to work out in my garage all the time and didn't have a bench, so I would do floor presses. Yeah, yeah, it's great if you have a you know a rack and you know you set the rack to whatever your arm length is and you're on you're laying on the floor. So by nature, just the mechanics of that, your elbows can't go past your torso. Mm -hmm. and that limits the range of motion. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, it's not something if you're interested in benching, uh, in, especially in competitive uh, nature for a long term, but for the short term, just reducing that end range can be helpful for an irritated shoulder. Um, that can keep somebody who's got irritated shoulder continuing to press um, without completely having to give it up. Um, an alternative to that is to uh, be inside of a rack and set the pins at a predetermined level so the bar can't go to a certain depth. Um, I know if you have a partner, using board presses can help. Um, if you're by yourself, you can get creative and put a band around a foam roll and strap it to your chest. We've gotten some funny looks at the gym doing that. Um, that can also limit that range. Um, some other things I found that have been really, really helpful is uh, doing decline uh, presses, uh, barbell presses. You ever done those much, uh, Brad? Yeah, I actually prefer those. I'm not a big fan of bench pressing. Like, I don't think I've bench pressed in probably 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I maybe do it about for a month out of the year now. Um, I had to start doing it because of my, some neck issues. I just had a habit that I couldn't break of pressing my head into the bench yeah. and I caused a lot of shear at I got a pretty uh, bad neck. Uh, switching to decline completely eliminated that. And the reason I go back to benching is just to see um, how much of a correlate there is. Uh, my bench has not changed hardly at all uh, by switching to decline. A <laughs> um, lot of people report the same thing. Um, another thing that can help a lot of irritated shoulders is doing uh, what I call inverted sets. So if you typically do three sets of 10, three sets of eight, you know, uh, four sets of 12, whatever, um, invert it so you're doing 10 sets of three. Um, I see a lot of form breakdown um, once you start pressing to fatigue. Um, some of it is habit, some of it is to be, you know, mechanical, whatever it is. Um, but I find when people mentally only have to hone in on three reps at a time, um, they can still accumulate the volume by doing multiple sets. Um, and finally, band push-ups. I find that when people can have an open hand that and on the floor, they're allowed to rotate their arms and hands to whatever position they feel most comfortable with. Um, harder to do when you're fixated with a bar. Um, so I find that people tend to do better with push-ups, even when you put bands around the back. Uh, we've been able to approximate in our studio a <laughs> pound uh, bench press uh, with the same approximate load as when you do a, um, a heavy banded push up. So you can still challenge yourself quite a bit with that. Um, the reason that I haven't mentioned using dumbbells is I find the start and the end for uh, sensitive shoulders to be a problem with the dumbbells, releasing the dumbbells to the ground and getting the dumbbells up. Um, Otherwise, it's perfect because you have a lot more degrees of freedom, which can be helpful for shoulders. Um, so those are my favorite um, uh, ways to continue to lift heavy, um, even if you have uh, shoulder problems. Uh, so a question along this line is, you know, how do you, somebody asked, um, how to best do shoulder presses if there's sensitivity and damage in the shoulder? So we've talked quite a bit about um, like, horizontal uh, work, but what about vertical work? So whether dumbbell shoulder press or military press or things like that. Yeah. Um, well, one thing um, obviously we have to do is see if we can figure out why it's becoming a problem. One of the biggest problems I see with people having a overhead press issue um, is, well, let me, let me start out first by saying, why are you, are you doing it? 
if you love doing it, okay, fine. You know, discussion over, we'll move on. Um, but if it's like, I just want to get big and strong, you can get big and strong without doing overhead presses. So I just want to clarify that some people think it's like a, uh, you, you have to do it in order to get big shoulders and get strong. Um, it's not the case, but if you just like doing it or it's part of your, um, your sport or so, uh, the first thing I look at was range of motion. Uh, I am surprised how many people are doing overhead press that have pain. And I look at their range of motion and they have maybe about 150 or 160 degrees. Um, you know, pressing overhead is just not going to work. Uh, yeah. You got to get, you know, that full range of motion there. So that's the first thing I look at. I look at the shoulder, scapula, and the thoracic spine primarily. So once you're there, then the next thing uh, we consider looking at is uh, – uh, using dumbbells. One of the things I love about the dumbbell is you can, again, orientate your arm in almost any position from your uh, forearm to your uh, to your shoulder. And that can make a big difference uh, for a lot of people. Um, after that, uh, then uh, looking into, of course, going to the barbell, but maybe again, going at different heights instead of racking it all the way down. Um, I like actually in this case, I do like using uh, something like a hammer uh, machine overhead press. The reason I like that is that some people have a hard time uh, with the bar. They have to swing their head out of the way and that forward backwards movement because of the bar can't go through the head can be somewhat of an issue. Um, so usually once we go through those stages, then overhead pressing becomes tolerable. Um, but there are plenty of people that uh, we just look at the risk and the benefits, uh, the effort that they have to take in order to resolve those impairments. Uh, and they said, it's not worth it. You know, I don't have to press. So we get rid of it. And if, you know, so in terms of like, let's say you want to build shoulder strength and you have some of these issues with shoulders, what do you think are the best ways to do that? Like, well, yeah, go ahead. Um, like dumbbells, cables, does it really matter like how far out your lever arm is? Um, are those the things that matter kind of from your perspective, what are the best ways for people to work around, you know, maybe shoulder pain while they're training? Yeah. So um, I think a few things, first of all, we have to appreciate how much the shoulders are working when we do almost any exercise. And if you want to really uh, appreciate that, ask anyone who's had a, uh, a very disabling shoulder problem, uh, a, a significant tear, they've been in a sling, um, it becomes nearly impossible to do leg exercises. It becomes, I mean, not impossible, but um, it's very difficult. Um, so the shoulders are working anytime you're doing back exercises, anytime you're doing chest exercises, they are at least a secondary mover, if not a prime mover, depending on the movement. Um, so I can make a very strong case for the limited need to do any direct shoulder work with the exception of maybe some rotator cuff work and some occasional elevation. Um, I have seen people build incredibly strong physiques, um, have high level performance, and they maybe are doing one to two exercises directly at their shoulder. Um, so I think that should be the, the first thing to appreciate. There are plenty of people that have some demands of their shoulders or their sport where they have to do overhead pressing or they have to do a lot of that. I would focus in those cases on rotational work. Um, the one thing that you don't get a whole lot of carryover with by doing a lot of pulls and a lot of pressing is rotational work. So rotational work at zero degrees, rotation work at 90 degrees. I like to use a, um, I know this is a, a catch all answer, but Depending on the person, I will rotate in between cables, bands, and weight. And a lot of it is just based on where the problem is and what they are. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, many people who want to throw or they want to do some type of overhead activity, they need to get good external rotation when their arm is you know, up in the air. So up near here. Now, if I have them do a dumbbell um, 90 degree external rotation, What's going to happen is that the load is going to be maximum at the beginning of the motion. But once they get to here, the, I could hold this position all day long. There's very little load on the rotator cuff up here. Yeah. So a dumbbell is not a great implement if I want to get end range strength in pulling all the way back. So if I'm a swimmer 
and I need to get this late, you know, external rotation, you know, in order to get into my, my uh, stroke, uh, dumbbell wouldn't be the best. But it would be good if it helps me initiate or facilitate the earlier ranges of internal rotation. Um, a band is going to be almost the opposite. You know, the band, depending on where you position the band, won't give you much tension until you get to the end. Mm -hmm. That's good for a stronger person that needs to maximally work external rotation at the end range. It's bad for somebody who's got some, a specific amount of pain uh, that um, their rotator cuff gets weaker the further into external rotation they are. So the band isn't matching the strength curve in that case. Um, the cable is, a, um, is kind of a in-between depending on where you hold, you position the cable, you get a little bit more consistent tension throughout the motion. Um, so if I were to pick one, I would say the cable is probably a more versatile option, um, but there's virtue of using a, a combination of bands and, um, and dumbbells. Perfect. So next, one of the other questions we had was, um, do you need an MRI to diagnose your shoulder problem? Yeah. Um, ironically, one of the biggest problems we see in helping shoulders is this false notion that they need an MRI. And the reason why it's a problem is our success rate in helping shoulders is directly proportionate to the time in which we see them and where their problems started. If you come in and say, I've had a 30 year or 10 year history of shoulder problems, um, it's going to take a while to unpack that. If your shoulder has been bothering you for the last week and a half since uh, you felt something, you know, tweak when you're doing some, uh, you know, some overhead presses, um, your resolution is going to be much more swift. And so that's an extreme example. But what will all, often happen is people will wait, you know, a few weeks and then they'll say, well, I need to figure out what's going on. So they see the primary care doctor. Primary care gives a, a very cursory analysis of that. Say, well, let's go see orthopedics. Orthopedics, you know, says, well, you know, the evidence shows there's not really good uh, risk to benefit ratio of doing invasive procedures now, um, unless there was a severe trauma, and even that's debatable. Um, so they're going to advise you to do conservative care. Uh, but they might also say, but first, let's get an MRI. That can take another two to three weeks to schedule. So in a relatively uh, proactive person, we're probably delaying things by about four to six weeks. And that is useless. Uh, during that time, we can already see uh, structural changes happening to the tendon. Fatty infiltrate will start permeating inside of the tendon, which will could permanently or at least temporarily weaken it. Um, we're also getting motor control impairments that can start um, uh, occurring in terms of compensations or uh, inhibition of certain structures. Or you just might be saying, well, I don't know what the hell is going on with my shoulder, so I'm not going to work out. And so you're going to decondition. And as you and I know, uh, most of us active people don't do well when we get shut down from exercise. Um, it's not a good mental health game. So I think there's a whole slew of problems with that. But that's just the pragmatic problems. If we're just simply looking at the science and we're looking at what the evidence shows, there's actually a lot of good guidance. First of all, a great study came out from Mass General Hospital in July 2019. I think it was Mark and colleagues. They looked at a cohort of about 51 people and they tracked their, their care. Uh, these people were screened to have shoulder pain and uh, mild functional loss. Uh, they were scored about a four out of five on their strength. So they could still lift their arm, but against resistance, they would eventually start failing. So they weren't horrible, but they were uh, significantly bad. They tracked what happened to them. They all got MRIs, by the way, right away. There was not one case uh, that ended up having surgery uh, within the next six months. The first case of there was only four out of 51 people, I believe, that ended up getting surgery uh, happened at six and a half months. So what they concluded is that it was useless for them to have had that MRI information. Um, what was also interesting, there was very little on the MRI that correlated with whether they progressed to having surgery or not. And that is very consistent with other recommendations. 
there's this anywhere from if you ask the, uh, the the surgeons that do a lot of the surgery, like journal of bone and joint surgery or uh, journal of uh, shoulder and elbow surgery, uh, many of those conclusions will show there's about a 70 to 90 percent success rate with non-surgical intervention. There is about equivocal findings about what is more effective long term surgery versus non-surgery. Um, huge, huge prevalence. Uh, you want to guess this, Brad? What do you think in people under 60 years old that have no pain and no functional limitations? What do you think the prevalence of rotator cuff tears is? 75%. Well, no, it's not that high, but um, <laughs> it's pretty It's pretty high still. It's about 34%. Yeah, I mean, that's um, still pretty high. Yeah, and it's 54% if you're older than 60. And these are asymptomatic high functioning, so no functional limitations. So this is another good uh, quiz for you. Um, and this was done a while ago in, in the late 90s. Um, the researchers want to do a um, diagnostic comparison between this is what healthy shoulders look like and unhealthy shoulders look like. So for the control, they looked at the healthy shoulders and they all went under MRI. And they are 49 to 17 years old. No pain, no shoulder problems. And they did an MRI. Take a guess of what the percentage of normal findings were. Sixty mm, percent. Zero. <laughs> there was not one shoulder that did not have some type of defect, uh, whether it be arthritis, uh, a lesion on the humeral head, um, a tear in the labrum, or tear in the rotator cuff. Is that is that as part of that because they had uh, pathologists or radiologists looking at it who are always just looking for a problem? <laughs> um, it was actually the, um, I believe it was the orthopedic surgeons at um, Alabama okay. Medicine Institute. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a Rorschach test almost, right? You know, I mean, depending yeah. on what perspective you have, you can find something. Um, the whole point of this um, is that it's incredibly common to find things on an MRI on perfectly healthy people. So you're going to maybe get some false correlations there. Um, the likelihood that you're going to need surgery or do better with surgery is relatively low. And um, most uh, of the best practices are suggesting that um, you first have to fail conservative care. And there doesn't seem to be any advantage of intervention before six months uh, when it comes to surgical intervention. So for all of those reasons, an MRI does not tell a great clinician what to do for treatment. It doesn't necessarily prognosticate as to how well you're going to do with treatment. Um, and it can delay uh, proper treatment if you wait for it. So um, <laughs> that's one of our comments from uh, from Eric. That's, that's very, Eric? very accurate, Eric. <laughs> I, I'm just asking him because uh, just to make sure he's not falling asleep. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's one. That's, that, I'm just thinking of that quote from Dumb and Dumber. Samsonite, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in the right ballpark, Brad. Come on. Great parenting move. I just finally had my kids watch that show, and uh, uh, they, it's, they're at that age where they're starting to get that that humor. So uh, I I probably quote that movie at least once a day, and generally people have no idea what I'm talking about. It's because they just don't remember all the classics from it. My uh, brother-in-law got his wife for her birthday an impressionist painting of uh uh what's his name jeff bridges um when he's on the toilet and that's oh something. yeah yeah there's <laughs> this big beautiful it's probably like four feet by three feet uh, uh i hope that's like hanging in their bathroom that, but that is awesome <laughs> that's one of those things where like if somebody gave that to me i would 100 percent hang it in my house yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's hanging in their bathroom at their ski house. I think so. That's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So uh, one other question that I have, I don't think it's it's on the list exactly, but it's kind of in the vein of shoulders and maybe other joints too. And I know we've talked about it a little bit before, but um. So tendonitis versus tendinopathy. Um. You know, maybe talk a little bit about what the difference between those is, and then, like, how do we deal with that? Like. I guess I'll use my own personal example. Like I have a B, like a patellar tendon that's always just kind of a little bit irritated. Um, it doesn't really seem to be associated with like overtraining. Um, like it just randomly flares up, gets better. Sometimes it's like 
just after walking or sometimes it's just after too much rest? Like, what do we know about the difference between those two and kind of what are the methods of addressing that? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, if you really want to geek out, if anyone does, I strongly urge you to um, go on YouTube and look up Jill Cook. Um, she is probably regarded as the world's foremost authority in this topic. Uh, I have learned amazing things uh, from her. Um, and what she will tell you is what the evidence is overwhelmingly suggesting is that tendons love load. Damaged, uh, painful tendons do brilliantly with load. If you want to assure that you're going to have a bad response uh, with prolonged pain or dysfunction, do not load it. Um, the evidence is, is pretty remarkable on this. Um, I, I will, I'm going to talk about this a little bit differently than at the shoulder because it seems that there is some regional differences. So a tendonitis in your, and we'll use that colloquial term right now, uh, tendonitis in your Achilles or in your patella um, may not be the same as tendonitis in your elbow and your shoulder. Uh, but in general, loading seems to work well. So the common term has been tendonitis and the itis at the end of anything implies there's infl inflammation. Now that we have a lot of techniques where we can easily take out tendon tissue and analyze it and do this in large groups of people, they're finding that the prevalence of inflammatory cells inside of these quote unquote tendonitis is incredibly low. So a true tendonitis is relatively rare. Um, so they're starting to use a term tendinopathy, which just broadly says that there is a pathology somewhere in the tendon. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, most of the studies that we have about treating tendonitis have, or tendinopathy um, tends to deal with the Achilles and the patella. And when we're dealing with uh, how much do we load, that's the biggest question. We know tissues respond well to load, but how much and how often? There was one researcher um, that uh, popularized a uh, treatment approach that would have you load it, uh, I believe it was like three sets of 10, three times a day. And that was done every day. And it was done uh, to maximal pain, pain tolerance. Um, so in essence, if you had eight out of 10 out of 10 pain, if you could tolerate it, just keep doing it. And surprisingly, people had pretty good results. But I think it was, you know, in research, when people say there's pretty good results, you know, we're looking at maybe an 80% success rate. Yeah. In my clinic, uh, I wouldn't be open too long if I had 80% success rates. You know, um, you'd have, you know, a huge bunch of people saying this is horribly painful and this is masochistic. I don't like it. Um, there was a uh, more recent study that used a different uh, loading criterion. They had people load to uh, a three to five out of 10 pain. The thing I like about this, people sometimes hate that, that scale. Well, you know, I have a high pain tolerance is the most common thing people say, or, you know, I, you know, I can tell her like, it doesn't matter. Um, it's what you decide a 10 out of 10 or an eight out of 10 or five out of 10 pain is. They found loading at that level, um, not to a six or seven, not below or two, um, you had to load it so there's some symptoms, but not beyond a five. Um, those people did very, very well. And I think their success rate was in the 90s. Um, what I was really intrigued by, though, I never liked the idea of loading it every single day. Um, a, I don't find a lot of people willing to do that. B, it just doesn't match with that, you know, low stimulus recovery response that I tend to see in other tissues. Um, so there was one study that showed people loading uh, three days a week did just as good as um, One caveat to that when it comes to the patella tendon, and this is super counterintuitive. Um, and Brad, I don't know if you know, did I tell you I um, have a, had a mid-substance complete rupture of the patella tendon? Did yeah, I think we talked about that a couple weeks ago. So... Um, which somewhat counterintuitive is that people that are in the more acute phases or in uh, the painful phases tend to acutely see their pain levels reduce when they load the patella tendon. 
So it's super counterintuitive, but I have experienced it myself when my knee has been aching and sore. I've been flying a lot or sitting a lot. When I do some wall sits or when I do some uh, on a decline board, uh, just some like mini squats or partial squats, um, acutely my pain will, will improve. And that is a very common phenomenon. So um, just some caveats I found about tendon issues. With the shoulder, we have to remember that the tendon size and thickness is fractions of what a patella tendon achilles tendon we're talking about the size of your finger versus the size of your hand mm -hmm. um and there's a lot more tension and friction involved as opposed to just you know um uh, or i should say mechanical pressure in uh, uh in friction as opposed to just longitudinal tension um some evidence shows that higher volume lower intensity and pain-free loading tends to help shoulders better. Um, studies out of Norway, um, it's called medical exercise therapy. So I treat tendon loading for a shoulder uh, tendinopathy a lot different than I treat a patella tendon or an Achilles. A patella tendon will be mini squats and Achilles will be um, slow uh, heel raise, heel depth um, raises. Um, a shoulder might be high, high repetition, low load movements. Many times it's a counterweight so that they're lifting less than the weight of their own arm. So, um, so yeah, so there's a, a little distinction there between the shoulder tendons and the, uh, and the Achilles tendons. And do you find in situations of, you know, tendinopathies, um, how do non-steroidals help, um, do they kind of help people work through the pain so they can load it and solve the problem? Or do they kind of, you know, mask the healing process or kind of what are your thoughts on the literature on the role that non-steroidals play in uh, like recovering from tendinopathies? Yeah, we don't, we don't have great evidence right now. Um, there has been some theory, but no proof that it um, can impact or delay the healing. Um, I can't imagine a short-term phenomenon where that would happen, maybe in the more chronic phases, uh, but I don't have any evidence that shows one way or the other. I know that there is some uh, limited evidence when there is suspicion of a bone uh, damage, especially when we're dealing with kids, because tendon damage in kids is actually incredibly rare. Um, yeah. When we're dealing with like little league elbow or shoulder, for example, uh, a majority of the time, uh, there is actually the bone is the weaker interface between the tendon and the uh, the bone. So uh, the pathology would usually be there. Some have said that non steroidals can delay bone healing when there is a suspicion of a fracture or a, um, you know, stress fracture. Uh, so that case, I'd be a little bit more in young people. I'd be a little more tentative with with older people. Um, and again, I'm talking about north of 18. Um, yeah. I think it's probably, you know, at the very least, um, something to maybe, you know, geek out on the research if it's long term. In the short term, the most important thing to me is to make people uh, comfortable with movement. And if taking some Advil uh, for 10 days uh, allows you to be less reticent to move and able to tolerate some loading, uh, just the behavioral component of that, I think, is a victory. Um, the healing, you're probably going to get more positive and negative. So I've yet to see any convincing evidence that there's a lot of negative. Um, there's a potential positive, but here's the caveat to this. There are some people that tend to respond beautifully uh, by taking some leave. You know, their shoulders achy, they take some leave, like, I feel great. And they go back to doing the same darn thing that was contributing to causing the problem. So... <laughs> That's 100% me. It's more like, I want to go do what I was doing. I don't care if it hurts me. I'm going to take this. If it masks it, good. I can get going. Right. I mean, if we're talking a competition yeah. or we're talking like, you know, I got to get through skiing with my kid and, you know, I don't want to disappoint them and be cranky and painful. Get, totally get that. Um, but if you're going to go to the gym to get a workout in, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, scratching a niche, you know, it's like yeah. it's not the point of a workout. And it sounds so logical when a clinician who's not dealing with the problem is saying that when you're in the thick of that though, you just right now, you just want to feel better so you can get on with the day and get your workout in. Yeah. Um, you could be doing some harm there theoretically. Um, 
and or you could just be delaying the healing. Um, so there's also been probably over the last, I don't know, five, maybe 10 years or so, uh, BPC 157. Um, have you heard much about that? I know it was probably like three or four years ago. It was pretty popular. It was some, some peptide, um, that people were using for like tendinopathy things. There's not a lot of research on it. Um, a lot of people just kind of have experimentally been using it on themselves cause you could buy it. Um, I didn't know if you had had heard much about that. I know I've read a little bit of the literature and it's like, I, it's just so all over the place. I just didn't know if you had heard anything about it. I, I haven't. What is the, uh, is it a the biological, like what's the, the mechanism? <sighs> yeah, that's, that's part of the question. Um, it's a, it's a biological, it's like a peptide chain. Um, let me look it up real quick, see what I can find about it. Look up the molecular targets. It's supposed to increase uh, VEGF receptor expression. So one of those kind of endothelial growth factors that is common in like soft tissue repair. Mm -hmm. um, but I think most of it's in, most of the research is in like cells and rats. And I know people have experimented with it on themselves. Like I've got a couple um, like MMA clients I used to work with who would take it because they had stuff. and. Those is, people. It, is it an oral? Um, that's a good question. I, I know in a lot of research it was initially injections, but I think now you can get it over the counter in terms of oral. Um, yeah. I may I may be wrong about that, but I think that's I think it's an oral, which is interesting. Sure, sure. It would seem that for its effect, um, as far as you know, I've you know looked at things. We talked about this, you know, a couple months ago about the stem cell and prolotherapy. So um, it seems that even the strong advocates of it are uh, suggesting that there needs to be a load component of it too. I think yeah. it would be similar to, you know, what we're talking about when it comes to building muscle, you know, of course there are some uh, things that will help facilitate that, but there ultimately needs to be a mechanical component. Uh, the most convincing evidence that we have is that there needs to be a mechanical component which is uh, really important to appreciate if you're somebody that has pain because the the intuition is to stop and rest. Um, when we're suspecting the tendon being a problem, that is a very, very poor um, way of treating it. Um, resting in terms of maybe stopping doing um, the same amount or the same way that you were doing the movements before, certainly, but completely not challenging that tendon um except for extreme pathology is is not a good strategy perfect any other thoughts or comments on shoulders before we let you get back to your hopefully not too blustery northeast <laughs> winter day it was brutal 20 like seven degrees out this morning uh, yeah we went out to the bus stop and just ran back in it was rough. <laughs> Yeah, a couple uh, a couple quick things. One, um, if you have a tendon pathology and there's a tear, people are like, "Well, how the heck did I load that thing? How is a tear going to repair?" Sometimes tears don't repair, but what we do find is the remaining tendon can get thicker and stronger uh, to the extent that it recovers to full function. So don't despair if you have a tear. I didn't quite try to make that a rhyme, but. Um, don't think that there's, you know, all hope is lost. Um, that would be one key thing. The other, probably two things I'd uh, leave people with is one of the most common ways you can fix a bad shoulder, um, is to stop sleeping on it. I can't tell you how many people have gotten relief just by sleeping with their arm on a pillow across their, their body. And there's really good evidence behind this. If you've ever seen somebody come out of surgery, there's a reason why their sling has a pillow underneath their arm. The reason being is that it improves the blood supply to the rotator cuff and it minimizes the amount of strain on the top rotator cuff, the supraspinatus. So just getting people out of the habit of laying on their side or sleeping on it um, for a, a damaged or irritated tendon, that can make or break uh, a lot of uh, success. So that's pretty key. Um, another uncommon solution that I found that helps a lot of people, when you have shoulder problems, you tend to forget that your shoulders involve things like squats. Um, 
changing somebody to a yoke bar. So instead of having their hands all the way back here on a high squat to having their arms out in front of here, um, you can rig one up a little bit, but if you take two wrist straps and put them around a regular bar and, and hold the bar out like this, um, that can make a huge difference. There's many shoulders that won't tolerate this uh, uh, position with it loaded with the uh, bar. So look beyond your typical shoulder exercises, and sometimes you can find some hidden solutions that are either aggravating it or causing some of your problems. Sweet. Well, hopefully people are now armed, pun fully intended, <laughs> with more knowledge to go uh, work around or through or solve some of their shoulder problems. Cool. So sweet. Well, Mike, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I hope that you have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk in a couple weeks from now. Sounds good, man. Take care, everybody. All right. Take care.